right, so today we come to the uh, story of David and Goliath, probably one of the most well-known and beloved stories in all of the Bible. Uh, we even have our, our phrases that have come from this in, in pop culture, right? When there's a standoff or a competition that seems unequal, one is much larger than the underdog or the other, they often say that's a David and Goliath match, right? I mean, it's, it's just well known. And we're often told to be brave like David, right? We're, we're, we have to have the courage like David. That's what we're told, right? If you just have the courage and bravery like David, you can overcome the giants in your life. Uh, those giants, whatever they are, right? The giants of low self-esteem, the giant of, of poverty, the giant of the bully down the street. And if you just be brave like David, you can overcome. However, that's not the focus of this story. You say, it's not? No. Well, then what is? Well, that's what we're going to find out. Let's read it today together and find out what is the story all about. What is this really about? What is the real focus of 1 Samuel 17? So let's begin uh, by, by setting the stage here in verses 1 through 3. It, it shows us now the topography of what's going on, where the armies are meeting and so forth. So we look at verse 1. It says, now the Philistines gathered their armies for battle, and they were gathered at Soka, which belongs to Judah, and encamped between Soka and Azekah in Ephes Damim. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered and encamped in the valley of Elah, and drew up in the line of battle against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on the mountain on the, on the one side, and Israel stood on the, on the mountain on the other side, with a valley between them. So you see the two armies are faced off here in the Valley of Elah. That's about 14 miles west of the city of Bethlehem. Now, look at the introduction of the main characters. This is what comes next. We've got the stages set. Now, who are the contenders? Well, in this corner, verse 4 tells us we have Goliath. It says, verse 4, And there came out from the camp of the Philistines a champion named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. He had a helmet of bronze on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze, and he had bronze armor on his legs and a javelin of bronze slung between the shoulders. The shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron, and his shield bearer went before him. So the writer of this book obviously wants to impress us with the size and the magnitude and the ferociousness of Goliath, right? No, no question about that. I mean, let's think about this idea of being um, uh, the, 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 the height. What was the height of, of him? Six cubits in a span. What was that? Well, a cubit is approximately 18 inches, and a span is about six inches. So having put, done the math there, which I am not good at, somebody else has done that, of course. But Goliath was around nine foot six, almost 10 feet tall. That's pretty high. Remember Andre the Giant? He was a little guy, seven foot four, just seven foot four, right? The tallest man on record is Robert Wadlow, and he was eight foot 11 inches. So, so, so Goliath is like a foot and a half taller than the, man, the, the, the only man in history that was, was, was known as the world's tallest man. But the average man, here's the point. Here's, here's how this, this, this measures up. The average size of the man in the Middle East during this time was about 5'6". So, of course, this is such a, a, a crazy matchup. And then we, we, it's not just the height, it's also this intimidating armor, right, that is put on for the purpose of intimidation, I'm sure. Uh, you've got all these things mentioned. He has a helmet of bronze, right, this helmet of bronze. Um, who knows how heavy that is? The coat of mail that they say was, was the, the, the 6,000 pounds, or I'm sorry, um, let's go back and read it there. And uh, yeah, 5,000 pounds, right? Um, uh, or shekels, rather. And that equates to 125 pounds, about 125 pound coat of mail. And then you've got the bronze armor on his legs. We don't know how much that was. Let's give it 15, 20 pounds. I don't know. All, all I'm saying is he had all this weight. He had a, a javelin. The word javelin there is, is kind of misleading because he also has this spear, the javelin. Uh, the, the literal Hebrew word is the word for scimitar, which is that Middle Eastern, Eastern curved sword, right, that was used in the Middle East and, and, and in Asia. 
And that's strapped behind, you know, between his shoulders, big spear, and the spearhead itself weighed 16 pounds. The very point of the spear, 16 pounds. All in all, this guy, this huge guy, is walking around with about 170 pounds of armor on and weaponry. And it's just amazingly intimidating to the enemy. I mean, that's what it's about, right? It's all about intimidation. It's like wrestling Oak Hills when Frank Schott Sr. was the coach and that team comes out in their black hoods and they do their march around the stadium. They stand there in all intimidation with their hoods down. I mean, that's the idea, right? <laughs> Sermon's over, right? Amen. <laughs> the first Samuel 16, 7 goes on to tell us though, look what, look what happens here. Because I mean, first Samuel 16, 7 reminds us something. If you think about it, the intimidation of looking on the outward appearance of, of Goliath, right? That's what's happening here. And yet, it seems as though chapter 16 was a warning, a purposeful warning for Israel. You, they should have taken heed. What do I mean? Verse 7 of chapter 16 said, Do not look on his appearance or the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. So that warning was already given us. And the men of Israel failed at this. So would probably all of us because we couldn't help but see the gigantic giant in the room. I know it's a bit redundant, but there it is. He was a gigantic giant standing before them. And their natural inclination was to let their eyes cause fear looking upon the outward. Now, verses 8 through 10, we see the challenge that this, this arrogant giant made to the children of Israel Verse 8, he stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why have you come out to draw up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? And are you not servants of Saul? Then choose a man for yourself and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and uh, kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistine said, I defy the ranks of Israel this day. Give me a man that may fight, that we may fight together. So there's this arrogant defiling of Israel from this giant, right? As he taunts them, challenges them, says, come on, right? There's two armies here. So this was an idea of substitutionary battle, uh, or representative battle that was not as known to the, to the, to the Jewish people, to the Hebrew people, but was more, more known to the Philistines, this idea of just let your representative come, your champion, and my, our representative will come, and whoever wins that, that'll end the battle, instead of slaying all these you know, hundreds of thousands of people. That was the idea. But look what happens here in verse 11. What's the result of Israel? When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly Afraid. Very afraid. Funny, isn't it? We've seen God do great victories already on the behalf of Israel. <laughs> Mighty victories. And yet they're still afraid of their enemies. They had no contender, right? To, to match up with what they were looking at. They had no contender that could you know, stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with Goliath physically. And you see, this was the only sphere that they could see, was the physical realm. That's what they're looking at. They're looking at their physical situation. They're not looking at the spiritual situation at all. They're only looking at the physical human situation. That's the only dimension of the battle they could see. Now, the, 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 the side note is this. Saul, King Saul, was head and shoulders above every Israelite. He was a tall man himself. He was the natural choice for Israel to go out there and fight. He was the king. He had heard God's promise that God will deliver. And yet, he's shaking in his boots, right? As, as, as at other times, he's hiding in the background when he should be taking the initiative, believing God and walking forward toward this giant, right? But now we move to the other contender in, in, in this text. In verse 12, we have the introduction of David. Verse 12, now David was the son of the Ephrathite of Bethlehem in Judah. Ephrathite was just an old name for Bethlehem. So literally the Bethlehemite of Bethlehem in Judah. Named Jesse, who had eight sons. 
In the days of Saul, the man was already old and advanced in years. The three oldest sons of Jesse had followed Saul to the battle. And the names of his three sons who went to the battle were Eliab, the firstborn, and, and next to him, Abinadab, and the third, Shammah. David was the youngest. The three eldest followed Saul. But David went back and forth from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. For 40 days, the Philistines came forward and took his stand. The Philistine came forward and took his stand morning and evening. So that's what's happening. We've got this standoff. 40 days, this is happening. Now, David is back and forth and evidently missing every time the giant comes out to challenge the people because he's busy serving his father, feeding the sheep at home. Now notice this in verse 17, how this, this ordinary task given to David by his father leads to an extraordinary event. And folks, this is something we need to grab as we're reading this. Think about this, because this is true. Ordinary tasks, just obeying God in the ordinary day-to-day -day things, leads to extraordinary events. God uses the ordinary. He uses ordinary people. He uses faithfulness in our day-to-day -day lives to accomplish his extraordinary will on earth. So notice what happens here, verse 17. And Jesse said to David his son, Take for your brothers an ephah of this parched grain and these ten loaves and carry them quickly to the camp to your brothers. And also take these cheeseburgers. I'm kidding, but he does take... <laughs> He, does, he says, also, take these ten cheeses to the commander of their thousands. See if your brothers are well and bring some token from them. Bring me some good news about my sons that are in the battle. So this is just an ordinary request from an ordinary father who loves his sons that are in battle. Verse 19. Now Saul and, and, and they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah fighting with the Philistine. And David rose early in the morning and left the sheep with a keeper and took the provisions and went, as Jesse had commanded him. An obedient son just following the, the ordinary orders of his father. And he came to the encampment as the host was going out to the battle line shouting the war cry and Israel and the Philistines drew up for battle army against army so the the the, the young David gets there and man the excitement overcomes him because he gets into the camp at, at the exact time that both armies are lining up for battle so they run down to their prescribed you know preordained battle lines screaming the war cry that's exciting right it's like watching Braveheart unfold before your eyes right there so David's excited about this and he gets distracted. Verse 22, And David left the things in charge of the keeper of the baggage and ran to the ranks and went and greeted his brothers. And he talked with them. And, 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 and as he talked with them, by the way, behold, the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, came up out of the ranks of the Philistines and spoke the same words as before. And David heard and David heard him. Same words, defying the armies of God. Now look what happens here. Verse 24 reminds us again of the fear of Israel. All the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were much afraid. So they broke ranks, as they've done now for who knows how many times, when that, when that giant comes out and challenges them, and they flee and they hide. Fear of man. They were so busy looking at the physical stature of Goliath that they failed to remember the limitless power of God. You see, this is what we, we do, right? And the enemy wants that to happen. He wants to keep our eyes on the problems, on, on, on the sins of the brokenness, of the pain, of the evil that's, that's attacking us all the time, instead of keeping our eyes on the author and finisher of our faith, as Hebrews tells us to do, why do we keep our eyes on him as we run the race? It's the only way we can finish the race. It's the only way we can run the race is by looking to the one who is stronger than all of our enemies. When we keep our eyes on God, when we're reading his word, when we're, when we're basking in the attributes of the limitless God of the universe, we will fear no man. We will fear nothing. 
We're going to see that played out here over and over, that, that concept. That's what, that's what drove David. The fact that he feared God. Then he hears this, verse 25. And the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel. Mark that. Note what they're concerned about. He's come to defy us. He's defying Israel. And the, and the king will enrich the man who kills him with great riches and will give him his daughter in marriage and make his father's house free in Israel. What a deal. You will be rich. You will have one of his daughters in marriage. And your father's house, your family, your, your father and all of his family will live tax-free in the kingdom. Wow. Verse 26 says, And David said to the men who stood by him, What shall be done for the man who kills the Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? What did he say? For, for who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Notice that. And the people answered him in the same way, so shall it be done to the man who kills him. They repeated, what will happen? Here's what will be done. You'll be given riches. You'll be given the daughter of the king. And your father's house will live tax-free. Now, think about this, the interesting part of this verse, especially verse 26, is this, the first three words. And David said. Do you realize this is the first time David speaks in all the Bible? This is the first time. Now, we've heard about David up until now, but we've not heard from David until now. Up to this point, we've heard man's view. We've heard the Israelites' view. We've heard Saul's view. But we've, we've not directly heard from David. And when David does speak, his words are as heavy as Goliath. <laughs> See, we get a whole different world view from David all of a sudden when he speaks. I mean, up until this point, the narrative has been godless. If we're honest with ourselves, it's been godless. It's been pagan. The view of, of Saul and his men, it's strictly from a humanistic rationale. No spiritual godliness. No theology whatsoever. All man's wisdom. They're racking their brains, right, for a human solution to their Goliath problem. That's what we've seen so far. But then David interjects Yahweh into the conversation. Something Saul should have done. David basically says, Does it believing in the living God matter? Does it believing in the living God make a difference in this situation? Do you think that the covenant God who is identified with his people is indifferent to these insolent, blasphemous attacks on his people and on his honor? And do you not believe that he will avenge himself? That's what David is thinking. I mean, the lesson is this. David teaches us that your view of God at the starting point of a crisis makes all the difference in the world. David already had this view of God. He didn't have to think at this moment of crisis when he sees this giant, oh, what do I think about God? What do I think? What do I think? Where's my faith? What do I think? What do I think? No, he already had it. You've got to already be established in your theology of who God is before you're attacked by the enemy. Your worldview and your... By the way, a worldview is simply this. What do you believe controls this world? Is it God or is it just the whims of nature? So David had a biblical worldview resting in God Almighty. And he's asking these people around him, what are you guys thinking? Does not Yahweh make a difference? 
I mean, th think of this too. I mean, it, it's also this this whole point that I just made is 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 is, is born out in verse twenty five when I told you to mark that. What did those men say? Surely this guy has come out to defy Israel. It's all about them. Their focus is them. He's come to defy Israel. Or as look what David said in verse twenty six. This Philistine defies the armies of the living God. David's focus is not on Israel's reputation. David's focus is on God's reputation. This pagan Philistine defies the holy God of the universe. And that shall not stand. It shows that David's belief that Yahweh was still the same person that he was back when he delivered the Israelites from Egypt and destroyed Pharaoh. When he used that term, the living God, that's important. He's emphasizing the fact that God is still living. He's not our grandparents' stories. It's not something that happened years and years ago. He is the living God. The same God that delivered our people in the past is the same God that will deliver us now. So again, the principle of resting in God today is this. Looking back at what God has done gives us the confidence to follow God into what God will do today. Knowing He's the living God. But look at this. We have another little break in the action is, is this uncharacteristic enemy attacks David. Before he even fights Goliath, David has to face two adversaries. The first one is his own brother. His own big brother, Eliab. Look at verse 28. Now Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men, and Eliab's anger was kindled against David, and he said, Why have you come down? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? Ooh, do you catch that public dig? I know your presumption and the evil of your heart, for you have come down to see the battle. Wow. And David said, what have I done? It's just words. I just, I, mean, I love that. I love this part of, of the reality of David as a little brother talking to his punk big brother. It's kind of what we all face, right? Big brother picking on him. What are you doing here? What is this and that? And David's like, I'm just asking. I'm just asking what they said that you'd get if you kill that guy over there. That's really what the text is saying there. But it's, it's, it's important to note that before facing Goliath, David must face the contempt of Eliab, who represents Goliath right now. That's the same message. You're all worthless. You're nothing. I'm going to defeat you. you you're, there's no one to save you. And that's exactly what Eliab was just saying to David. What do you think you're doing? What are you doing here? I know the evil of your heart. And, and where's those few little sheep, little shepherd boy? That's all you are. You see that? But here, here's, here's the glory that we see in verses 31 through 32. Because David fears God, David doesn't fear Goliath or anybody else. I love this truth. Look at verse 31. When the words that David spoke were heard, they repeated them before Saul, and he sent for him. And David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. Mm. So again, Saul hears, what a minute, you got a guy that's interested in this? Yeah, David was actually very interested, they could, they could tell. By the fifth time he's asking them, now what is it again? Oh, what do you do? Oh, you're going to get that? Okay, that's, you sure about this? All right, I'm ready. So Saul hears this, bring him to me. And David, David right away begins to encourage Saul and says, let nobody fear this, this giant. I'll go fight with him. So the opposite of the fear of God, folks, the opposite of the fear of the Lord is the fear of man. You cannot do both. It's impossible to fear God and man at the same time. So, so the problem with Israel, their focus is on themselves, not on God. Therefore, they fear the human enemy out there. They do fear men. But David said, no, I, I, I'm looking at the limitless power of the Almighty God, the host of heaven's armies who fights for us. We can't lose. What has taken you all so long? 
to get this job done because God is the one who fights for us. Now David has to face this criticism after he says that from Saul. Verse 33, And Saul said to David, You are not able to go against the Philistine to fight with him, for you are but a youth. And he's been a man of war from his youth. So you just can't do it. So again, another bit of an attack, discouragement, accusing. And the enemy does that. That's his MO. He accuses the brethren. He accuses us, God's people. And I love the, res- the response here. I love this. You've got Saul saying, David, you can't beat him. And now you're going to have David say, no kidding. But I know who can. That's, that's the point of this whole thing. It's not ever about David saying, oh, I'm pretty agile, man. I know it sounds like that. We're going to see some things where David talks like that. But that's not ever what David is saying. He's never saying, I can do this in my own strength. 1 Samuel 17, 34 through 37. But David said to Saul, your servant used to keep sheep for his father. And when there came a lion or a bear and took a lamb from the flock, I went after him and struck him and delivered it out of his mouth. And if it rose against me, I caught him by his beard and struck him and killed him. Your servant has struck down both lions and bears, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them. For he has defied the armies of the living God. He has marred the reputation of God. And verse 37 goes on to say, and by the way, that shows again that David was obsessed with the honor of God and his reputation in this world. Not his own, but for God's honor and reputation. Look at verse 37. And David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. So there's David's faith, never in himself but in the God with limitless power. And I love what Saul says. Saul, having been roused from this this theological speech, reminding him, David reminded Saul of the sovereign power of God in his covenant relation. He used the name Yahweh. He is our covenant God. We are his covenant people. He is all powerful and he's promised to fight for us. And then Saul says, David, you're right. I'm going with you. Let's go. Oh, wait a minute. Let's read the text. That's what it should have said. But what does Saul say? And Saul said to David, good luck. (laughs) And Saul said to David, go and the Lord be with you. That's what the mighty king said. After being reminded of God's sovereignty. Go have fun and may the good Lord take a liking to you. That's that's all he said. Crazy. Now we've got to be sure here to keep verse 37 in the forefront. That's very important. Verse 37 is the hinge pin upon which all of this swings. Otherwise, we will misconstrue verses 34 to 36 into meaning that David defeated the lions and the bears by his own, you know, his own grit and cunning. Which again is what we hear preached all the time. People, they, they, they love to stay on those verses. Well, David defeated the lion. David defeated the bear. What a scrapper he was. He's something else. No, verse 37 is the key to interpreting all of that. The Lord delivered me from the lion and the bear. David never trusted in his own self-sufficiency. It was always God who he was relying on. So again, David is, Ralph, David says, David will be delivered not because he has true grit, but because he knows the true God. That's why. Now look at this. David suits up for battle here in verse 38 and 39, or tries to. 
Verse 38, then Saul clothed David with his armor. He put a helmet of bronze on his head and clothed him with a coat of mail. And David strapped his sword over his armor and he tried in vain to go for he had not tested them. Then David said to Saul, I cannot go with these for I have not tested them. So David put them off. That tested simply means I haven't practiced in this. I haven't fought. It's uncomfortable. I can't really move. I I haven't trained in this and it's pretty heavy. So he took them off. Now look at verse 40. This is glorious because we're moving into the confrontation now. David and Goliath. Verse 40 says, Then he took his staff and his and in his hand, he took a staff in his hand and chose five smooth stones from the brook and put them in his shepherd's pouch. His sling was in his hand, and he approached the Philistine. Yes. Now look at what happens here. David approaches the Philistine, and in the next verses we see, and the Philistine laughed. That's what we're going to see. Verse 41. And the Philistine moved forward and came near to David with his shield bearer in front of him. Now think about that, that intimidation. Again, you have this giant, massive guy, fully armored, all the weaponry you know, that was known to man at that time, plus another guy. Plus his shield bearer in front of him with his giant shield in front of, of, of Goliath. And he comes, and when the Philistine looked and saw David, he, he disdained him, for he was but a youth, ready and handsome in appearance, and the Philistine said to David, am I a dog that you come to me with, with sticks? And the, the Philistine cursed David by his gods. The Philistine said to David, come to me and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and to the beasts of the fields. Mm. So, so I love this because it's such a great moment because you had David here with his sling. Don't underestimate this stuff, by the way, this sling action that David had. He did have some. God gifted David. Can't denounce that. Do we not know that David has been preparing for this day according to the sovereign, predetermined plan of God for years? All of that was part of God's plan. The shepherding in the field, shepherds use slings. Man, that's just what they do. And I mean, if they're not using them to, to actually ward off enemies and foxes and bears and whatever, they're practicing. They're, and they also use the sling and, and lighter rocks to actually herd their sheep. They got good at this. Very accurate at this. And this sling, by the way, is a long strap, a leather strap with a pouch in the middle. They would place the rock, hold both ends of the, of the, of the string, sling it around, let go of one part of that, and whoosh, that rock would come flying out. At speeds of 125 to 150 miles per hour. Yeah. I've seen guys drop from a 95 mile an hour fastball. Talk about a 150 mile an hour rock coming at you. So this is what David has, and this is what David is good at. This is what David's natural talent given to him by God was. It was he was trained, yes, he worked on it, but God permitted that. Don't misunderstand this and saying that it's all human. You know, David happened to be great. No, God trained him and equipped him for this all those years of being a shepherd. It was God's sovereign will that David knew what David knew. And it was God's sovereign plan to use that. Verse 40, 45. Uh, but by the way, I also love this too. When the Philistine says, I curse you by the Philistine gods, big boy. That's what, that's what the giant said. And I could just hear David thinking sarcastically in his mind, Oh, is that the gods like Dagon? The god that fell before our god twice and lost his head and his hands? All right, good deal. <laughs> That's no problem. <laughs> Verse 45. Then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts. I come to you in the authority of God Almighty. That's what David is saying there. That name, that means the authority, the power, the majesty of God. The God of the armies of Israel whom you have defied. David, had no, David saw one thing here. He saw from God's perspective. David saw Goliath you're in trouble. 
This is the done deal. You're already in trouble. You're already defeated. You've already blown it. That's how David saw this whole thing. He says, he, he goes on and says, This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you down and cut off your head, and I will give the dead bodies of the host of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, and that all this assembly may know that the Lord saves not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's. And he will give you into our hand. Whew. David proved that he can be just as boisterous as Goliath. I mean, he gave, just a, a, he gave a speech that blew Goliath's stuff away, man. Inspired by God. He's speaking for God, for God's honor, and proclaiming the truth that God already has this victory in hand. I love this. You know what it shows? David and Jonathan had a big view of God and therefore lived in big faith. They walked in big faith. There, it wasn't their faith. It was because of the big view of God. They saw God as he was, and that's what empowered them. It's God that gives us that faith. But you've got to be looking at him and know who he is and know his attributes and know what he's done in the past and know and be confident that he's going to do this in the future. That's what David was doing here. And Jonathan and David, that's why they become best friends, by the way. They're both trusting in God and saying, what is wrong with the rest of these people? Let's obey Him. We can't lose! And again, for David, it was about the reputation and honor of God, and it's, it's all about that. David knows that God is jealous for His glory. David knows some things about God. He knows that God is jealous. There's that verse that freaks people. God's jealous? Yes. Yes, Oprah. He is. Because he has a right to be jealous because he, he is the only one that measures up to being perfectly adored and worshipped. He Alone. Him alone. There can be no glory for anyone else because he deserves it all. We don't. That's why it's sinful for humans to be jealous. That's why it's a sin for humans, but not for God, because God deserves it all. And David knew that. And David knew that he's not going to let this Philistine get by with dishonoring his name. God will give you to us. Let's hurry. Verse 48. Then the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David. I love this. The battle's not long, folks, so, so relax. Keep your dinner plans. Verse 48. When the Philistine arose, get this, I love this. When the Philistine arose and came and drew near to David, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet the Philistine. <laughs> it's like, it's, David is so confident in God's glory, God's uh, honor, God's power. He just can't wait to get it over with. He knows the outcome. Giants walking and David's like, okay, been waiting on this. Woo! Here he comes. Let's get this done. So, so David, it says, he, he runs toward the Philistine. Quickly, it says, toward the battle line to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand in his bag and took out a stone and slung it and struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead and he fell on his face to the ground. Wow. David operating by the power of God and just the way God had trained him to do, just instinct, but all by God's grace, running as fast as he can toward the enemy like he'd done many times in, in, in the fields with his sheep. As he's running, he's reaching at the same time into his bag, something he's done a thousand times, putting it in a sling, sling, and probably not even thinking. It's just routine because of how he's been trained by God. That's the... That's the, again, the, the you get my point. This was all meant to be. Slings that stone, boom. Right into the cranium of the giant, and down he goes. So David prevailed, verse 50. So David prevailed over the, the, the Philistine with a sling and with a stone and struck the Philistine and killed him. There was no sword in the hand of David. Then David ran and took the sword uh, to, and, and, and stood over the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of his sheath and killed him and cut off his head with it. When the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. One of the shortest poems in the Bible. When they saw he was dead, they fled. And it's true. 
the, the champion was done. Killed by what? This is, again, the, master of, uh, 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 the masterful way God delivers. He doesn't use might and power of man. He doesn't use armies, chariots. He doesn't use swords, spears, as David said. He uses a ruddy little shepherd boy with a little stone. You see, nobody dreamed that God would redeem his fallen people the way he did. Most would look at a sovereign God like this and see him coming through the heavens with all of his massive armies and destroy the wicked and deliver his people in great victory and power. But instead, he has his son born as a human in a little stable from Nazareth. Can anything good come from Nazareth? And he allows that boy to grow up. And he's mocked and battered. And as he's a, as a man, he's, a, he's falsely accused and falsely tried. And then he's, he's taken to the cross where he's beaten and spit upon and stripped naked and mocked. And then he, he dies humiliatingly in front of everybody. Crushed by his own father. Looks like the worst defeat in history. And yet it is the most glorious victory of all time. That's how God does things. And this is what David is saying. I, I don't have a sword or a spear. I come to you in the name of God. I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts. And there's victory. Now, in summary, I just want to say this. I, I, think, I think, again, the, the main point of this story, get, get out of this idea that you want to be David. You don't want to be David. David's just a sinner like us. We want to love God like David loved God. That's what we want. We want to honor God and his reputation like David honored God. He honored God so much. He was so obsessed with God and his glory. He believed his promises so much that his reputation meant nothing. His life meant nothing. It was all given over in service to his heavenly king. That's what we need to get from this. That's the dedication we need to, to God, not to our great ability. I like what Ralph Davis, Dale Ralph Davis says. I know I quote him a lot. Many of you say, wow, that Dale Ralph Davis seems to be the new Charles Spurgeon around here because there's so many quotes. But he's, 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 he's masterful on the book of 1 Samuel. Several preachers told me when I was preaching through this, you've got to get Dale Ralph Davis. And then I find out that Dale Ralph Davis was Glenn Durham's instructor in seminary. So that's another bonus. But anyway... Listen to what he says here. I don't know who that compliments or, or whatever, but anyway. <laughs> Poor Dale Ralph Davis, I'd say. But anyway. <laughs> Listen to this. The driving concern of this chapter is the honor of Yahweh's name, his reputation, his glory. David is driven by a passion for the honor of God. Does this make any difference in how one interprets the chapter? Yes. It should keep us from going around talking about the cleverness of David or the bravery of David. The focus of the chapter is not on David's courage, but on Yahweh's adequacy in David's weakness. Yahweh's adequacy in our weakness. That's what this is. That's how we're going to walk away with this. If we're walking away from the story of David and Goliath with any kind of selfish, grandiose ideas about how we're going to, in our great faith, uh, you know, defeat our enemies, then we miss the point. We got to walk away from the story humbled and running to Jesus and looking to his glory and becoming obsessed with his glory and his reputation. Davis goes on to say, Hence, in this chapter, David essentially says to Israel and to us, Yahweh's reputation is at stake. That matters to me. That matters enough to risk my life for it. Now that's the question as we close. Does God's honor and reputation and holiness matter enough to you for you to lose your life over it? And that's what we're called to do, by the way. Not, not, a, not always a physical death, although that may happen. But dying to ourself, dying to our ambitions, our dreams, our selfish desires. That's what Jesus calls us to do. Die to yourself and follow me. Pick up your cross daily. Follow me. What he's saying there is, I must become literally your obsession. You must be obsessed with my glory, my holiness, 
my grace, my love, my power, my adequacy, my sufficiency. That's what the call of the gospel is. So I, I just wonder, as I read these, I, I see that, that, that David was a man who rested in God. I see Jonathan was a man who loved God so much, rested in God so much, that he was willing to die believing the promises of God. Totally forgetting himself in order to obey God. How many of us really do this? I know we come to church. I know we like to, to, to do Bible studies. And I know we like to talk about God. But do we really love God so much that we're willing to lay everything down for His holiness? Do we get upset when God's honor is blasphemed is the question. Do we get upset when God's laws are mocked God's commands are derided and defiled by the Goliaths of our day. That's, that's the real thing that we should be concerned about. Not that somebody hurt my feelings or that I didn't get that raise and so I need uh, help from God to defeat that Goliath, my mean boss. No. We need God's strength to stand up to a world that curses His name and mocks His word. That's what we're called to be. Those who stand in the gap of this world for the King of Glory, His ambassadors. So I ask, are we willing? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close here, but I just want to say that tomorrow, Monday, January 7th, 2022, Bill C-4 will become the law of the land in Canada. You say, what is Bill C-4? Has anybody heard of this? Few people. Bill C-4 will become the law of the land tomorrow in Canada. I just want to read. Now, now Bill C-4 deals on the outside. This is, this is their straw man that they built, but this is what it says. Purportedly, it's combating an old, kind of mainly discarded in Christianity, uh, a system of, of conversion therapy, it's called, of, of causing a LGBTQ person to convert to heterosexuality. And, and it was, it's been, it, I, it's, it's just not a biblical model. I mean, it's not what we're called to do. You said, wait a minute, you say we're called to accept as they are? I didn't say that either. The gospel and, and confronting in a godly, gracious manner, all sin, including that sin, and calling people to repent. Yes, that's what we're called to do. But there are some weird things to this convergence therapy. That's why the Canadian government jumped on that because they knew that people would be appall appalled by some of the tactics in that old conversion therapy uh, system. And so they use that. It's kind of a springboard. Now look, I want to read the preamble to this Canadian Bill 4C4. Here's what they say. Whereas conversion therapy causes harm to society because, among other things, it is based on and propagates myths and stereotypes about sexual orientation. So we have to understand what they're saying here. They're not saying, they're not attacking some of the wrong methods and practices that were actually used that really would hurt somebody. They're, jump, they're, they're using this thing called conversion therapy, but they're saying, here's, here's the problem. It's based on and propagates myths and stereotypes about sexual orientation, gender identity, and gender expression, including the myth, myth, listen to that, myth, that heterosexuality, one man, one woman, and cisgender, man and woman, uh, identity, and gender expression that conforms to the sex assigned to a person at birth are to be preferred over other sexual orientations. Now, this is, this is important that we understand what's being said here. God has said, all through his word, Genesis 2, Matthew 19, in the beginning, God created them, male and female. You see, God's already spoken about all this, and we forget, and we get so caught up in our world, we get so caught up in our culture, and we get so caught up in these little arguments going back and forth between humans, and we're not looking to God. We're not looking at his honor. We're not looking at his commands. We're not looking at what he's already stated, and we get all emotional because, oh, I know somebody who's LGBT. I do too. Well, and then my feelings are hurt because I don't want them to be sad. I understand. But that doesn't mean that for the sake of somebody's sin, we make them feel good while we dishonor our God, while we defame His glory. 
why we blatantly go against his moral teaching. So I bring this up because it's real, folks. This is, now, this is, this is happening. This is a law tomorrow. Now, that language is a problem because it can be misconstrued. It's so vague. Practices that, that, that would cause someone to feel that they are being pushed from their gender that they'd like to be or, or whatever. So when we preach, here's the point. Here's what's so dangerous. So when we would simply preach the Bible and simply read Genesis 2, God made them male and female, and simply read Matthew 19, that what about marriage? Well, it's between a man and a woman. When we read and simply teach on the biblical order and design of man and woman, we could be arrested as hate crime violators and thrown in jail or more. Now, this is happening. I just want to read close with Paul Carter's response. Paul Carter is a pastor who writes for Gospel Coalition, and uh, he has published this on the Gospel Coalition. This is a response to, to this this bill, and it may help us. He says, the idea that gender equates to biological sex would have been taken for granted by every generation of Canadians prior to this one. Do you understand that? And we, this is where we have to have a reality check as Christians who are buying into this modern culture and, and the strange approach to facts. There is no facts anymore, by the way. But listen, He's simply saying that a generation ago, every person in Canada would have agreed, yes, there is male and female, period. That's just what it is. We can't make up our own genders. So, so, so the idea that gender equates to biological sex, and we understand that, right? Your, biology, your gender is what you were born with. That's what he's saying. Everybody would agree to that. Every generation of Canadians prior to this one would have. To enshrine the spirit of the age as the law of the land is an act of hubris. Now, do you get that? To enshrine the spirit of the age, that is whatever goes now, what man wants to do in his own eyes, to enshrine that as the law of the land is an act of hubris. It's no different than Goliath hubrisly attacking the living God of Israel. To refer to the beliefs once held universally and still held broadly by many Canadians as myths and stereotypes is an act of blatant intolerance. That's the point, folks. These little, little bit of language here and there that undercuts the sovereignty of God and His commands. That's what we, we, we take it hook, line, and sinker sometimes as Christians. We're like little frogs in the kettle being boiled to death and we, we, we stay as the heat rises and we just kind of get along and we go along to get along and we keep doing that. And we let people call the very Word of God, the sovereign God of the universe and His teachings, myths and stereotypes. And this is an act of blatant intolerance, then the net result will be legal exposure and authorized harassment of pastors and churches. And I agree that this is where, this is simply what he's trying to bring up. That as, as this continues in our culture, as we preach the Word of God, simply preaching it in love, I mean loving people. Because we do love people, we're going to tell them the truth of, of the gospel that calls us to repent from all sin. But as we do that, society will continue to harass. Now, my question is simply this. Are you in love with God enough? Are you so obsessed with His honor? Are you so entranced with His gaze? You're, you're, you're looking to Him daily. You're in the Word daily. He, he, his direction is the first you seek, not man's. Is that where you are? Because if it's not, you're going to falter in the years to come. I'm going to falter in the years to come if I am not totally focused upon the reputation and the honor and the glory of my Heavenly Father. How do we get there? We pray for each other. We pray for, for God's grace. We pray for God's faith. We pray for the boldness. And we pray for the love and the gentleness to forgive our enemies, to love those who despise us, 
to, to, to love people genuinely and to gently proclaim the Word of God in love and truth. May God use us for His glory. That's our prayer. Let's pray. Father God, we thank You for Your Word. and Lord, I, 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 I don't know exactly why You led me to end this way, but Father, I know that You're calling us to be Christians Literally, not in speech only, not just doing the minimum, but to truly be your people, regenerated by your grace, therefore keepers of your law in a world that has thrown it away. So Father, let us realize that this is a heavy task, but let us learn something from our text. It's not about us. It's not our strength. You've already won the victory. You just use us to complete it. So let us walk forward. No, not walk. Let us run like David toward Goliath, believing that you will overcome, that you have overcome, that you will give the victory, and that your name will be glorified and honored. Give us that kind of grace. We pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen.